Hey YouTube and welcome back to the IoT Developer Masterclass. Now, in previous videos, we've kind of focused more on using the ESP32 and connecting to an MQTT service and broadcasting data and receiving that data maybe on another device or connecting to Google Home or like in our last video, we were able to publish the data to an event hub that then used, uh, sent that data to a web API and used machine learning to suggest what setting our device should be. Now, in this next series of videos, what we want to do is we want to be able to create a platform. So two weeks ago, I was thinking about what to do. And initially I thought about, hey, why don't we use ThinSport, open source platform? And it's really cool. What they have here is, is pretty massive and very neat. And I was thinking maybe I should do a video on this. But then I thought to myself, why not let's build everything from scratch? Wouldn't that be fun instead of learning how to do some new configuration or something, right? So in the end, I was able to come up with this IoT connector application. So basically, it's just a small application. You can sign in. You can also add new users to your platform, right? You can register a user. You can sign in and and be able to you know configure the system you can create groups you can provision devices you can upload device create you can either create a new device here or you can use a provisioning process to provision them right and even after provision devices you can then connect to the devices and you can see some data here coming from connected devices that we have uh, right now, right? So let's say we were to connect the system. You would see if those, if their device is connected, we would start seeing data being populated, right? And how cool would it be if we were just able to just have a system that works on its own? So you could see here that we have devices all connected. The system here is actually connected to the system. You're gonna learn a lot in this video, right? You're gonna learn how this, how the architecture of this, and we are also able to uh, control this devices. So let's say we wanted to turn on that red lamp. Uh, this is red LED 43 here, right? We wanted to turn up the turn it on. We can send a command and here it is on, right? Same thing with the blue LED. You could just go here and say you want the brightness to be on and you send that and the blue LED comes on, right? And if we were to maybe say we wanted to reduce the brightness a little bit and we decided we wanted to reduce the brightness, so say, let's say uh, 20%, right and we send that you'd see the brightness go down and uh, we could do the same thing to the red we could change the brightness to maybe 20 and that also goes down right and we could just maybe just if we're not gonna do that we can just turn them off right and it's very easy to build this and you know it's interesting and it's really cool to be able to sit down uh, look into the architecture of this try to figure out what you want to do and then put it together and just build it and we'll talk a lot of details about how this is even possible so so i really hope you enjoyed this video please feel free to like comment and share and Let's dive right into it. So this was our initial uh, design for an IoT system that we've been using since the beginning of this class, right? And we had an ESP32, which we've been using up until now, that connects to an IoT hub, we assume will connect to an IoT hub. And in previous videos, we've shown how to use the MQTT server provided by HiveMQ. And then, you know, we have all these connections from IoT hub to our PubSub that takes the data from IoT hubs and routes it 
to the correct system, right? So whether we are trying to um, route a device management uh, information or telemetry data or, you know, notifications or provisioning service, it routes it to its um, corresponding cloud function, which is a serverless function. Uh, and then that cloud function stores that information in a database, which can then be accessed by our business services and APIs or the user. We are a WebSocket, right? A WebSocket server. So up until now, this is what we had. And we've shown different iterations of this. Now, what we intend to do is to make something a little bit more close to what to that design. And here, what we've done is we have uh, sensors and actuators, right? Uh, connecting to a, a Raspberry Pi, and that Raspberry Pi on initial boot will provision itself, right? So it connects to our server, our API service, and then uh, using a key, um, an API key or a certificate will register itself, right? Uh, so that it can start connecting to the RabbitMQ server, because for it to connect, it will need authentication and authorization. So once it registers with this provisioning service, this provisioning service will then create its user information in the RabbitMQ server, right? Once it creates that, it will send that information back. And now this Raspberry Pi can now start connecting and sending or receive data through the RabbitMQ server. Now, if you notice here, we, and, and you can read more into this uh, on your own, right? We are looking at diff the different types of exchanges that we use to connect to or, or send or receive data from the RabbitMQ, right? So here we have a fan out exchange when we're sending telemetry data because we'll send it out to whoever is connected, right? So with fan out exchange, it routes messages to all the queues bound to it and ignores routing key messages usually, right? So whoever is connected, um, whichever consumer is connected. And so once it sends out this message that gets processed and when it's receiving a command, it uses a topic exchange. Uh, with a topic, you it's more like a URL, but uh, in, in the topic exchange, you have different topics, right? So basically they're routing keys that the device is listening to. So if, if it's on its topic, then the device would respond to that. And if it's not on its own topic, if it's on some other topic, uh, the RabbitMQ won't forward it to the device. It will only forward information that's relevant to the topic that this device has registered for, right? So if this device registers for a particular topic, RabbitMQ will send message to that topic. And we will see that in the code as we progress, right? So once we're able to send message to these RabbitMQ server, right, we would have some consumers, um, which is our event hub, listening, right? Uh, so at this point, our microcontroller is our producer. It's producing data, telemetry data, sent into our RabbitMQ server. Our RabbitMQ server then looks for the consumers that are connected to it, right? Right uh, for this particular video and for this particular training we would be using a node.js application for an event hub that is a consumer that will connect that will be constantly connected to this RabbitMQ server and once there is message it will route it to this event hub right now what we've done here and, and you would see it as we progress is we use a fair, fair task work queue and what that does is we, we have multiple consumers, right? We would have multiple consumers that are registered and you would see it in the code. You can increase the number of consumers as you want. Uh, we would have multiple consumers and basically the RabbitMQ will send it to whoever is available. So if 
a one of the consumers or one of the event hubs becomes available it says okay give me data and the RabbitMQ will send data to it and once it's working on that data it's not available for more uh, data so whoever is available the RabbitMQ will send that to the next person who's available and then once it's done processing then it tells the RabbitMQ server and the RabbitMQ server knows the next time now to give it data uh, that same event hub data if there is data right so it kinds of um, it's it's a easier approach and ensures that things are clogged in the system and so that you're using all your consumers and you're using it well because some some tasks might take longer to process than other tasks in this video generally the tasks are quick not really much uh, so you probably don't need it but in a bigger system right uh, you would need something like that right so and then the event hub after processing the message, it would store the information in the database. Let's start from here, right? So it collects the telemetry data and stores it in the time series part of the database. For this, for this tutorial, for this video series, we would be using MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB kind of provides us the flexibility there to have a database where we can store our data and also a time series database that we can use to store time series data, right? So we would store the information and then also forward the information to the WebSocket server. So whoever is registered to receive that data for a particular uh, channel, uh, this event hub is also going to be forwarding that information to our WebSocket service, which then our users can access it. So that is the major change. Here are certain things that we need and we didn't really input yet. So we had the load balancer that would help us. We don't want to get into that right now, uh, just because this is a training video and there's just too much information already. So, we, but it would be nice to be able to configure a load balancer so that it can route messages to the different API services uh, properly. And so, also route messages to our WebSocket. So maybe in, in in the next series of videos where we might be discussing more about Kubernetes, uh, we might be installing Nginx uh, to help serve as a load balancer um, to serve some of these services, especially our WebSocket service where we have multiple WebSocket pods uh, spun up, right? So here we also have our machine learning service, which we are not using at the moment so that's grayed out so if you notice on our previous video we had we discussed more about machine learning and how it can be used right we used it to switch on and off francis's and his dog uh, parsons right the, the lights in their home and we showed how that example works right and then we also have our analytics services to check and you know just work on data uh, maybe do some aggregation on certain type of data that's also great out we won't be doing that in this application in this application right because this is a small application but this is just to just show you other things that you can add basically as, as we progress. So this is what we're proposing to build, right? This is what we intend to build by the end of this video. And I really hope you enjoy it. For this video, uh, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be installing our backend service, which will include our REST API service, our database service, our RabbitMQ service, we would also be installing our dashboard service, which is our front end based application, right? That will connect to our back end and be able to give us data. And we would also be installing our event hub service. And this service handles data that's going to our RabbitMQ and data that's been pushed into our web sockets, like we've talked about, right? And then once we install these three, we would walk through our application, go through some of the code and just see what's in it, right? And then in our next video, we will be uh, setting up our Raspberry Pi and, and installing our application on the Raspberry Pi and then running it, right? So we'll go through all this. I really hope you enjoyed this. And now let's get into it.